everyone. Um, just quick introductions. Um, my name is Itai. Uh, I had engineering at Monte Carlo, um, and I'm joined here by uh, Pratik. Nice to meet you all. Uh, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, data quality and data observability in the lake house. Um, so quick intro, no, no need to go into too many details here. What we're going to talk about today is we're going to start with a high level kind of um, definition of data observability. Um, we're going to hop into observability tailored to the lake house. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about challenges and tips from our own experiences. Um, and we're going to uh, show you a little bit of Monte Carlo's data bridge integration. So first, what is actually data observability? So let's start with, with actually defining a different term, uh, which we call data downtime, um, which refers to periods of time where our data is partial, wrong, missing, inaccurate in any way. Um, and really what that means is um, you can't trust your data. Um, I want to have a quick show of hands, like who can actually relate to, to actually ex experiencing a data downtime uh, incident? Right. Quite, quite a few hands, right? Um, and so this is actually a, you know, wh why, why is data downtime even important? As organizations adopt more and more data and rely on data for mission critical business decisions and even products that are customer facing, being able to tell that your data is reliable, uh, is accurate, it's all there right on time, becomes very, very important. Um, and so data observability comes in to solve this problem of how can we ensure that our data is actually of high quality, um, that everything kind of checks out. And you know, coming from, a, from a, a software engineering background, I can tell you it's very, very similar to what we would look for um, in applications. Um, observability is being able to say, you know, our application is running as expected. Uh, it is, its performance is exactly what, what the SLO uh, says, um, and, and, and our customers are happy. Um, and maybe kind of to, to give a sense of what data downtime can cause, you all kind of indicated that you've experienced it yourself, but a couple of pretty public uh, cases of data downtime that happened. Um, one is actually Netflix being down uh, in 2016 for 45 minutes, so it's a pretty big deal. Uh, this was due to uh, duplicate data uh, in their pipelines. And another pretty well-known case was um, when Unity actually had um, bad data lead to uh, $100 million uh, in, in, in misspending on ads. Right? So there, the repercussions of bad data could be very, very serious. Um, it could be reports that are shared with the CFO. It could be even make it to public uh, earning calls uh, that rely on data that data engineering teams uh, create and, and maintain. And so to address this, um, and I'll kind of share just a kind of quick, quick story from our own experiences. Actually, a few years ago, um, when um, why, kind of to, to showcase why, why predicting all data downtime is very, very challenging, is we actually had, uh, we're using PySpark, um, we had a schema change actually happen somewhere upstream, which actually caused an inner join to result in a lot less data downstream, um, which caused a pretty severe incident for our own production ecosystem at the time. Um, and it's very hard to predict when you're making a schema change like that somewhere upstream. It could be someone from a completely different team that's changing the data, um, and that actually is leading to downstream impact, uh, causing data downtime for other teams. And so data observability, um, how do we kind of think about it? It's very, very similar um, to the operational approach to software reliability, to application reliability, where we want to be able to understand that an issue is happening. We want to have the right tools in place to actually triage and resolve the incident as quickly as possible. And then lastly, we want to learn uh, and adapt and get better over time. Um, and in application observability, we have um, the different pillars, the metrics, the traces, uh, and the logs that are there to help us. So for example, as an engineering team, we monitor our database CPU, uh, elastic cache, um, memory consumption, application performance, P75, P90, whatever you know, the SLO kind of defines, but we want to know when something breaks, right? We don't want to be the last ones to know when something, uh, when something breaks. We don't want our customers to actually give us a call uh, 
um, and, and let us know that the application is not responsive, right? We want to be able, we want to be on top of it. We want to be there before anybody else reports it. Same goes for data teams, right? They don't want to hear from their consumers that, um, that the data is, is wrong or, 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 or feels inaccurate in any way. Um, and so kind of borrowing from, from there, uh, data observability is really not that different in, in a conceptual way, right? We want to detect issues. Um, detection means it could be ML-based anomaly detection, it could be rule-based, defining SLOs for different data sets. Um, and then we want, which is not, it's not, you know, it's just as important as detecting the issue is also being able to direct it to the right team. As organizations and data teams grow in complexity, it is much, much harder to actually get the right notification to the right person within the team or within the multiple teams, right? And then after we are made aware of, 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 a, of a data, potential data issue, we want to have the right tools in place to go ahead and triage and address the issue, right? Um, we want to understand the impact. Is it really important or, or is it something that's, that's pretty minor um, that, that, you know, might not really justify throwing too many resources at? Uh, and then lastly, we, we of course want to improve over time. Um, we want to, to, to learn from, from these incidents uh, and get better. Um, and so I'm going to talk now about the five pillars of data observability, uh, freshness, volume, quality, schema, and lineage, uh, and kind of explain, you know, really briefly what, what each of those means, right? So freshness really refers to uh, how up-to-date the data is, right? Has this table that updates on an hourly cadence all of a sudden hasn't updated in five hours. Okay, what does that mean, right? This could mean that we're relying on reports uh, that have stale data um, and that could have serious repercussions, right? So that's, that's what freshness is about. Um, the second one is, is quality. So quality looks at the actual data and different aggregated metrics on the data. Um, it could be the distribution, which values are accepted. Um, it could be the null rate. It could be the uniqueness rate, for example, a column of order ID might have to be unique. And if all of a sudden we're seeing even a slight percentage that's not unique anymore, this could have, again, serious repercussions downstream. Um, third is, is volume, right? So how much data is actually coming in? Uh, if all of a sudden we have a big drop in volume, maybe we've deleted uh, a chunk of data that we shouldn't have. Um, if, if all of a sudden you know, table size grows by, by a factor, right? That could indicate duplicate data. It could indicate many other different problems, right? So that's another uh, of, of the observability pillars. Um, and fourth is schema change, right? So schema changes are kind of, you know, my, my way of thinking about it is a little bit like code changes, right, for, for software engineers. When, when the schema changes, it could be perfectly okay, right? We might have planned this. This is exactly what we wanted to do. But it could also have, like, I shared with, with our own story from a couple years ago, it could actually have pretty serious re repercussions for downstream consumers, right? In our case, we, we kind of made a pretty naive kind of change to the schema. We removed the column, but that column was, was actually being used in an inner join, and that inner join that was not safe and actually resulted in a lot of data being dropped in that operation, right? So being able to even know that schema changes happened in the last, I don't know, 24 hours, week, whatever the time frame is, for those assets uh, could be very, very important when we're trying to understand an incident. Um, and last but certainly not least uh, is lineage, right? Data lineage refers to, um, you know, being able to understand where, right? Where is the data coming from? Where is the data going to? Where is it being used? It's important when we're trying to not just address the incident, but also understand the impact, the potential impact of the incident. If we're seeing that this this, this table actually is used by mission critical BI reports downstream. This means this could be potentially a very, very important kind of SEV for the data engin engineering team to work on. Um, and then from, from upstream perspective, we want to be able to trace back the problem even at the field level, understand where are, you know, these null values coming from or where is the extra volume coming from, right? So this is really a way to understand our ecosystem and where is data coming from, where is data going to, and how it's used. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Pratik to talk about observability in the lake house. Cool, thank you, Itai. So like you mentioned, we're gonna be talking a little bit about observability now specifically to the data lake or lake house. So starting off with our first pillar that we talked about, freshness. 
Uh, so a data lake's measuring freshness at scale really requires collecting events from both the storage layer and stitching them with metadata about the table location. And you can also use metadata that's available from more asset compliant uh, formats like Delta. So what this really means at the end of the day is that uh, calculating freshness is a combination of data sources. So if you're looking at formats like CSV, JSON, Parquet files, what you want to do, one approach you can take is you collect the table and partition locations from the Metastore. If you're using a blob storage like S3, this would be the bucket and the prefix to the path where the underlying objects are located. And then you collect the update events from the storage layer. Again, if you're referring to a storage layer like S3, you can leverage something like event bridge or S3 events to, in near real time, catalog changes that are happening to these sources. And what you really have to do after that is stitch these two things together. So as you notice a change at a specific location, you have to go figure out and map it back to the corresponding table, and that way you can catalog a freshness event. Now, if you're using a format like Delta, which is most likely powering your lake house if it's a more modern one or you're migrating to it, this is more similar to how you would approach a warehouse, where basically you don't need to go down to the storage layer. There are a couple of reasons for this. First of all, the storage layer isn't really any more an accurate uh, source of what's happening because corresponding changes to the data locations don't necessarily map to changes to the underlying data because other things happen with, with, with more complicated formats, like their vacuum events and stuff like that that don't necessarily map anymore to your changes. Another thing is we have powerful tools like the Delta Log, and Databricks makes it really easy with like a describe detail command as shown here on the screen, where you can basically get the last modified time. So what you need to do is collect freshness events from these two sources. Cool. Now talking a little bit more about quality. So with data lakes, you can leverage Spark SQL or any other query engine, whatever you really prefer, like Athena, Presto, Hive. It really depends on how you yourself have set up your lake. If you're using Databricks specifically, you can leverage something like SQL warehouses or periodic jobs. Again, regardless of the technology you use, these queries can be reactive and kind of alert you when different thresholds are breached or a little bit more proactive, and you can treat them as circuit breakers where you can kind of stop your pipeline uh, and this, again, is, doesn't really matter what technology you're using to manage your pipeline, what orchestrator you're using, using Airflow, you're using DBT, you're using the native scheduler. You can kind of do the same generically across the board. Um, but, but at the end of the day, basically, if data doesn't meet your requirements between these different transformation steps, like let's say after transformation or after an ETL or ELT job or before the BI dashboard's updated, you can be basically made aware and data can stop, that, like incorrect data can st be stopped from flowing further downstream. You can use other approaches as well, like you can use uh, data sampling and various different range of queries. So here on screen, I have three very, very simple queries that you can apply, and there's a bunch of others. You can leverage cardinality, you can leverage percent null, percent zero, you can check if two tables are the same record for record, you can check if two tables have the same number of records, if you're doing a migration, you can kind of create quality rules to measure what your exact business requirements are. You have the flexibility here to do so. Okay, now volume. So with data lakes, measuring volume at scale requires collecting events from the storage layer and stitching them with metadata about table locations and using metadata in asset compliant formats like Delta. Now that line might sound really, really familiar if you were listening when I was talking about freshness. It is. Um, basically, you will rely on the same combination of sources here. So for formats like Parquet, CSV, JSON, you take the data from you take the locations from the partitions and the location for the underlying table from the meta store. You take the blob storage locations and you stitch together and do that fun mapping. The big difference here, though, is that unlike with freshness, when you're dealing with volume, what's happening here is you're only collecting changes or deltas in, 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 in size. Right? You don't actually have the initial volume. So what you need to do if you want to have the original volume is you need to bootstrap that. And again, it's going back to the original example of S3, you can leverage a tool like S3 Inventory to collect the original size and then calculate how that's changed over time. You don't necessarily need to do that. If it's only if you need the total volume. Sometimes just having the difference over time is enough for you to detect patterns and changes. And then again, if you're using a, a format like Delta, the approach is very, very different. You can, again, just simply use the describe detail command and it gives you exactly what you need with the size and bytes right there. The whole point is cataloging and collecting this information and building these patterns, though. Cool. Now for the next pillar, uh, schema. So you can use metadata to help track uh, schema over time. And especially with lakes, like the examples Isai talked about, um, keeping track of schema is very, very important. 
What you want to do here, basically, is you track the previous schema for each table and compare it to the current schema on some sort of periodic basis. This can be very simply done by just computing the hash of the schema and comparing it with the current hash. And if it changes, you can diff the two to see whether a field has been added, a field has been removed, or maybe the data type changed. Um, of course, this kind of varies a little bit based on the metastore you end up using, but at the most basic level, you can leverage just the tools in Databricks. You can use the describe commands, and you can, if you're using Unity, you can use the information schema. If you are using another metastore, like an external Hive metastore or Glue, you can connect to those directly and batch such operations. Another important thing to consider with schema, though, is not just the structure of the underlying table, but if you're using semi-structured data, like one of your columns as JSON, what, uh, what you also want to check there to see is the keys that there don't change over time as well. So you can take a sampling approach if you're operating at a very large scale to see if the keys you expect to be there are still there over time. And if they're not, you can investigate what happened. Cool. Now the last pillar, and again, certainly not the least, lineage. So measuring lineage at scale requires collecting and parsing SQL logs if you have them available, or integrating with the UC lineage APIs for Spark-based jobs. Basically, at the end of the day, the more sources you have for a lineage, the better your lineage will be, because you want to build the fullest picture and create as much context as you can. As many things you can add to that, the more accuracy you can build there. And it's important to consider the two different types of lineage. You have table-level lineage, which is lineage across platforms, like you have your transformations in, in your intern warehouse and external to the warehouse, like when you connect to BI tools, and before, from, like data, from the underlying data sources. And you also have field-level lineage, which is more granular and precise and operates at the individual fields, like what field references another one. The former gives you that really nice bird's eye view of your entire data platform. And it's really great for that context or discovery. Imagine you are working with a new hire in your team and you want to teach them about your data environment. One of the easiest ways to do them is show them your core assets and show the lineage, show them these are the transformations that happen, and show them this is what happens downstream. And it, gives, it helps paint that picture of this is what our data environment looks like, and this is the schedules it updates, and this is what's going on. Now, at column level lineage, you can make a lot of really, really interesting insights, like impact assessment and root cause analysis. Some examples of that are, like with us, can you deprecate a column? An easy way to check is with column level lineage. Is this column being referenced downstream? Then it's probably not safe to deprecate it without figuring out why it's being used, having a migration plan, or whatever applies to your particular business, right? It gives you the tools to make these decisions and be informed about what, what your choices will impact instead of just hoping that, okay, I really don't think anyone's using this and no one's talked about this, so it's probably not a real thing, which sometimes happens. Um, you can also use it to help triage different incidents. So let's say you are working through an incident and a table upstream had a high null rate or had a high zero rate, and you, you can see the impact of that to this table because this, this column refers to that column, right? And you can do a bunch of different, different types of analysis like that. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about various different data quality challenges and tips from our experience building data observability. So first of all, first of all each metastore or source of truth of the lake is very, very different. So monitoring should be too. Data lakes basically have a bunch of different technologies involved, and they're mixed and matched, and they've been here for a while, some of them are newer, right? It really just boils down to the way data is structured and the various different entry points a lake can have. If you're working with a more traditional warehouse, it's generally the interface is more uniform. You have one central way to manage it, and a warehouse from one org or to another org or one team to another team doesn't vary that much. Um, lakes can be very, very different from one place to another. And this kind of entails the different components of it, like the metadata, the storage, the query engine, the query logs, and of course the lineage. It applies both at the pillar that we talked about, or I like to refer to them as jobs, and the source of truth, which are the different metastores, like external hive, glue, internal, and UC. And this table summarizes some, but definitely not all of the different approaches you can take to kind of access the different components of your data. When you are starting out, it might make more sense to use one particular one, like use Spark, just to simplify operations. But as you get to about larger scales, you do want to consider other ones um, because they don't operate the same way. And this is especially important to separate out jobs, um, especially if you're in, like, doing something like a migration, like migrating from a legacy metastore into UC. They each have their own different scalability limitations, and when you are in like, the UC world, you can leverage APIs that weren't available before. Cool. Now talking a little bit more about scaling in general. 
So metadata collection is not really the usual workload Spark was intended to handle. It doesn't scale really well with the number of workers and really has diminishing returns from work vertical scaling. Basically what happens is the driver gets saturated with these metadata operations. What's really going on under the hood is you're effectively tr scanning a transactional database that's not directly accessible, and you have queries that operate in the magnitude of seconds. Now, why seconds matters here is if you're dealing with only 100 tables and you need to collect this at a specific cadence to build patterns, like generally, let's say you want to collect data every hour to make sure you can keep track of, let's say, freshness and volume. 100 tables, one second per operation, you can do that, right? Maybe you'll have to scale it up a little bit here and there. You can have two jobs running. But what do you do when you have 100,000 tables or you have 500,000 tables? The same approach doesn't really work. So that, to that end, it's really important to consider connecting directly when you can or leveraging different things like the information schema or the APIs in UC to maximize the number of batch operations you can take. Another approach you can consider is the scaling by discrete jobs, both within a data set and within an operation type. What this means is like metadata operations have very different scalability requirements than just SQL requirements. So like how you collect volume and uh, freshness is very different from how you collect quality because the type of query is very different. Some are built for more Spark-based workloads and some are purely metadata operations. Um, and then sometimes you just are working with specific schemas. So let's say you know there's like five or six schemas that are incredibly important to you and your org. Maybe that's a great place to get started with. And another thing you can consider is maybe just focusing on delta tables. That's, that could also simplify some of the tentacles you have to manage. That way, all the storage layer stuff is abstracted. You don't have to worry about if you're on AWS, if you're on Azure, if you're on GCP. You have this nice abstraction layer in the Databricks world. And another thing, when you compute something that's unlikely or infrequent to change, consider caching it. You can use a new table, you can use an actual cache, but you don't need to recompute data again and again. Um, that needs to be crawled at a specific cadence. Uh, a very good example of this is, let's say, you have different operations based on whether a table is delta or not delta, right? Um, whether a table is delta or not will most likely not change over the life cycle of the data. So you can skip that query and cache those values as, as much as you can so you can jump to the next operation. Similarly, um, different types of data will have different cadences you might want to collect them at. So let's say freshness and volume needs to be collected more frequently to build these patterns, but maybe you're less sensitive to schema changes and you can consider collecting them once a day. So you can offload some of those heavier operations to that cache or just perform that like a different schedule. This also gives you the ability to, and more flexibility to run specific queries when something has changed. Uh, one nice example of that is with volume. Uh, so the, you, we, when I was talking through what's available through the delta log, you have size and bytes but that operation is actually pretty expensive at scale. So one that is very surprising is just a simple select count, which is what Spark was actually built to do, especially if you're using a format like Parquet where a lot of this data is summarized, can actually be more efficient for certain operations. And then of course, outside of the wor world of just metadata, leverage partitions. It's a pretty obvious one, but if you're, if you're operating with very, very large scales of data, you might want to only consider looking at the f first X number of weeks because that's probably the most relevant data that you're querying. You don't necessarily need to look through petabytes or terabytes of data. Okay, I also want to leave you all with one tip that we found through, through our operations here uh, when leveraging job clusters specifically. So unlike an all-purpose cluster in Databricks, the default pool size for job clusters is one. Now you might be wondering why does it matter that the default, pool si uh, that the default uh, cluster size is one. This, you can think of the pool size as the number of clients effectively. So what happens is it gets saturated and basically your operations start queuing behind one another. And this makes it very difficult to parallelize. So very simple recommendation we have is when you're working with job clusters, increase that number so you can parallelize as much as possible. And if you want to scale metadata collection in general, other considerations are like leveraging a SQL warehouse where uh, some metadata queries are not queued at all. Okay. Cool, now I want to talk a little bit about Monte Carlo's Databrick integration itself. So that was like a lot of different stuff to keep track of, to manage and build that both myself and Itai summarized. So we're gonna insert a little bit of a shameless plug here, sorry about that. We're gonna talk a little bit about Monte Carlo itself. So what we do is we basically provide a holistic, single pane of glass view across all your data assets. You can think of a data, data dog or new relic for application observability, but for what's actually in your data. And we leverage things like machine learning to try to understand what's normal and what deviates from that in your pipeline, raise alerts, insights, and provide various tools to help RCA. We also try to help you provide context and impact without you having to define anything. And if you do want to define operations, you have the flexibility and freedom to do that too. 
So like I talked about single pane of glass, so starting at the code level with where your code is in Git, to the different orchestrators you're using, to the transactional databases, warehouses, lakes, and BI tools, all comes into our platform. And from there, we do our magic. And stuff can go to various notification channels. You can get alerts in Teams, PagerDuty, Slack. You can create a Jira ticket when an incident happens. You can connect it to your data catalog. And one thing I especially love is that we have a big emphasis on being developer friendly. So with that, we have an API which gives you full parity with what you can do in our UI. There, anything you can do on our dashboard, you can do programmatically. In fact, you can do even more programmatically. So it gives you really the flexibility to adapt use cases to what you want to do. And to make that easier, we also provide an API explorer which helps with experimentation and discovery. So when you want to test out different APIs, you can do that directly from the UI. And when you're ready to productionize them, we have a Python SDK waiting for you which does all the things you'd expect from an SDK, like handle auth, handle automatic retries, give you native objects, like dot notation if you're working in Python, all that fun stuff, as well as tools to accelerate the common things, like if you're working with circuit breakers or if you're working with PII filtering, all that stuff is built in. That same SDK powers our CLI, and that CLI allows you to do a bunch of different things from onboarding to working with insights to different discovery-related things, as well as working with this thing we like to refer to as monitors as code. And why monitors as code is important is it allows you to define monitoring programmatically, similar to how you do in the engineering world as with an infrastructure as code tool. Think of Cloud Formation or Terraform, but for monitoring your data. This allows you to have all the things you'd love from the engineering world from a programmatic tool, like you have the ability to uh, codify things, you can have reviewability, audibility, you can monitor things, you can put them in your CI pipeline, you can have things build off one another. And that's, that's what monitors as code get, lets you, allows you to do. In addition to that, there's an airflow provider which makes things like circuit breaking a little bit easier and gives you a lot of that insight and data that we were talking about to help contextualize your lineage with your airflow DAGs, as well as uh, webhooks, which basically allow you to kind of react to an incident when it happens. So obviously when an incident happens, you'll get a, you can get a Slack message or a Teams message or an email, but you can also get a webhook, and that way you can react to the incident and maybe let's say you want to update your BI tool based on the incident, you can do that through webhooks. Okay, so how does all of that work? So I want to briefly walk through like our collection overview. This, on the left here, you can see a bunch of different data assets. Obviously not all of the ones we connect to, but you, can, you see data warehouses, lakes, BI tools, and you see this, this thing called the Monte Carlo Data Collector. You can think of this as our agent or primary interface between your resources and our platform. It's, even though the, it says data collector, what it primarily does is it collects metadata, metrics, stats, and aggregate information. So, it, so, and how it does that is there's two approaches you can take to kind of managing it. You can ha let us manage it, and in that case, we become a fully SaaS platform and it abstracts away the complexity of managing resources, and all you have to do is worry about connecting. If you prefer, you can also securely deploy it within your own VPC or your own cloud um, and host it that way and allow the connections to go through there. Regardless of the choice you pick there, um, all of that connects uh, is generally our primary interface to our monitoring system which does, uses the traditional tools you'd expect. You have search, a database, some storage levels, and our own analytics and detectors, some of which are powered by Databricks. We not only dog food the integrations we use, we use a lot of the products that we share ourselves. Um, regardless of all of that, all of that ends up in our data monitoring system, which powers the dashboard, the reporting system, and all the programmatic tools that I talked about. Okay, so now about Databricks specifically. I wanna to touch a little bit about how metadata collection, how we do it for, for Databricks. Uh, so what happens basically when you're setting it up for the first time is you can use our CLI or our UI here on the left. Uh, you add a connection. Once that connection is added, our data monitoring system starts creating some resources and scheduling uh, various jobs. All of that gets routed through that data collector that I talked about, and depending on your lake, whether you're using Databricks, Glue, or you want to connect to the storage layer, we handle all of that, and we run things on different schedules and stream data back towards us. All that stuff gets back to that monitoring system where these insights are generated, where, the, where that catalog is built, and you have all of these assets to manage. For Databricks specifically on the right here, you can see what, exactly what our data collector does for some particular metadata jobs. What happens is when you start it for the first time, it provisions some secrets and scopes, it creates a notebook, and then it creates a workflow. And then that workflow is responsible for collecting some of this metadata. And if you prefer to do this manually, you can do it yourself. We just automate it for you to make it a little bit easier. And now here in action are two different screenshots. The one here on the left is our integrations wizard. So if you prefer, you can use our UI to connect, provide some very basic information like workspace, whether you want to use a SQL warehouse for querying or you want to use an all-purpose cluster or however you want to connect. 
you go through that and it kicks off the job. If you are a programmatic fan like I am, you can also leverage our CLI to do the exact same thing, where on the right you provide some basic stuff and then you can manage your integration that way as well. Now, what happens when an incident actually happens? So triaging an incident. So let's say you get that Slack message or you get that uh, email. What happens is there'll be some information on that that can help you get started, but most importantly, there'll be a link to our Incident IQ page, which is basically our incident management tool or framework. What happens there is we coalesce all the different sources and data I talked about, like the code from Git, whether you're using Orchestrator, that data appears there too. Whether there was previous incidents, whether someone was using this table, or all of that fun stuff, is all there in one place, like different RCA tools and different queries to help you root cause analysis and try to reduce that uh, TTR. All of that's in, in there. Specifically for Databricks, we provide access to your Delta history as well. So what happens here is that you can actually see when query logs are not available, you can see different things like the timestamps for different query operations on this table, who ran this operation. So let's say it runs every hour and there's this gap. That, could prob that might be the cause. Or someone ran an ad hoc query that would show up here as well. So different things to just kind of make it easier for you to triage this because we're trying to source all this information in the same place. Cool, now I wanna talk a little bit about a customer who actually gave a presentation yesterday how they successfully leveraged Monte Carlo in their lake house. For a little bit of context, Comcast Effective is uh, Comcast's internal data product that monitors media campaign performance. And they use Monte Carlo to monitor campaign pacing and performance data. It's basically data that collects daily impressions to active campaigns. So if a data issue occurs, it's pretty important. So if you look here on screen, you can see a setup which might be very close to how you're managing your data. You have different data sources and different services that are responsible for ingesting it. Stuff ends up in your lake, in this case, leveraging Unity Catalog, and it's transformed with traditional and medallion structure, where you have bronze tables, you have silver tables, and gold tables. After the transformations are done, data ends up downstream to your actual consumers, your BI tools, your external parties, your internal parties. And all along, you have Monte Carlo sitting there from end to end there, helping you with detecting if an issue occurs, and if an issue does occur, giving you the tools to help root cause analysis and prevent it from happening again. So this is one simple example, and we're excited to work with a bunch of different customers and happy to talk about the whole Databricks integration or our integrations in general. But with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. If you want to learn more, you can meet us at booth 407, or Isa and myself will be here to answer any questions.